be able to welcome you this evening to what I think is going to be a very <coughs> exciting and interesting uh, event. We have with us uh, this evening uh, two uh, infamous uh, well speakers said. in the, well uh, said. In the <laughs> theatrical world, uh, both in terms of performance, production, leadership in the arts community in New York and in other ways. Um, so tonight we're joined by Robert Lupone, who is the director of the uh, MFA program at the New School for Drama. Uh, Bob has had quite an interesting and storied career. Um, he's a member of the Actors Studio and has been on Broadway in True West, A Thousand Clowns, A View from the Bridge, Late Night Comic, Zoya's Apartment, Swing, St. John, boy, he's done a lot here. And also, I think most, uh, most notably, was the Zach and the Forest Lines, so we might know him. He, uh, in a different, uh, in my younger days. In his younger days, perhaps he, he received an Emmy nomination Yesterday. for his portrayal yeah. of Zach Grayson on All My Children. So that's another uh, venue that he's been in. Uh, he won a Joseph Jefferson Award for his role as Crow in Two of the Crimes and has a number of film and television credits. Bob's president of the uh, board of Art New York and artistic director of the MCC Theater in New York City. And he has agreed graciously to introduce and interview for us his long-term colleague and friend and um, collaborator in some ways, um, Elizabeth Williams, who has joined our faculty as a part-time faculty member just this semester, teaching a course entitled uh, Creative Arts, Cultural Workers, and the Vitality of Cities. Elizabeth is an archaeologist uh, by training, an art historian by scholarly interest, and has been involved in a number of field site projects. The course she's teaching now really looks at the deep role of culture in cities. She's really interested in the cultural transformation of cities. In her professional work, she has been affiliated with uh, more than with productions that have been nominated for more than uh, 80 Tony Awards. Received, I apologize, received more than 80 Tony Awards, three of which she's received personally. So um, uh, Bob and Elizabeth have, have decided this evening to do our conversation in an interview conversational format, and I think you'll find it very uh, enlightening and entertaining. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So thank you for the opportunity, and Liz, it's always a pleasure to be on stage with you, so I'm <laughs> looking forward to this. Um, and I'm for kind of free- been there yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yes, you have. I'm kind of free willing, so if, I, if anything strikes you while I'm doing the interview, just put up your hand and we'll just ask a question if you so feel so inclined. Um, one of the things that I, in looking at your, uh, your uh, what do you call it, your resume or your um, accomplishments, I was noticing, um, and I'm looking at this Internet Broadway database where uh, it's a database online where theater people go to find out about other theater people. And I've noticed, for example, in most of the pr uh, productions are commercial, and most of them are on Broadway. But the, what's interesting to me about it is the, 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 the variety. For example, Moon Over Buffalo, which was a comedy, comedy also a revival of Electra, which is a tragedy. Uh, Moon for the Misbegotten, which is a drama, and also the real thing, drama. One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, drama. Noises Off, comedy. Uh, Top Dog, Underdog, comedy, drama. And Elephant Man, drama. That is one side of the scale. <laughs> and the other side of the scale, which is really interesting to me, is Crazy For You, a musical comedy. Secret Garden, musical comedy. Ain't Nothing But The Blues, musical comedy. Cabaret, musical, obviously. Music Man, revival. Um, Flower Drum Song, revival. Gypsy, revival. One, one that my sister was in? Wow, we should talk. Um, uh, Actually not, Bernadette. So. Oh, Bernadette. Oh, that, well, that, we should talk. We should talk. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Bombay Dreams, which is presently, uh, is it presently? No, it's just. It's going to be made into a movie. It's coming into a movie. So you're getting, getting into movies as well? I have done, yeah. Okay, yeah. so let's first talk about theater. Okay. So how artistically, I mean, you know, I put a show together, I put a season together, and it's a hell of an opportunity and also a very difficult decision, which play to do, which play not to do in a season. How did you come up against such a disparity of projects from Electra all the way to Gypsy? I mean, that's such a wide range of interest. It, 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 uh, number one, I like to laugh. So well, that, therefore, okay, that so justifies those the, the comedy. comedies. Right. That gets rid of the comedies, okay? <laughs> That's good. I love beautifully um, structured farces. But my archaeological background um, draws me to works like Electra, you know, based on, the, you know, based on Aeschylus. Um, so th this is, I think that a lot of what informs my interest is the sort of archetypal underpinnings of the story. I'm a mythology person from my dissertation years and my work at Columbia. And I always look for story before I look at anything else. And I think of myself as um, 
um, a creative producer, you know, one who's So, but involved. musicals can give you that sense of story, mm -hmm. like, as, comp as opposed to One Floor Over the Cuckoo's Nest? I mean, that's the thing about musicals versus drama, which has always been a... Well, you're, you're more of a drama guy. Yeah, I am. Yeah, you are. And, but for me, the, 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 um, the song, which is really taking you into the interior life of that character, just enriches the drama if you do it right. If you do it right. And your sis, speaking of your sister, your sister was in the musical that hooked me, which was Les Mis, right, my right. very first musical. Want to tell us about it? How'd you get it? How'd you get tell into this I tell business? That story? Sure. Okay. This is this is one of these unlikely stories that um, we all have to get into this business. <laughs> well, well I think a lot of people always believe they will be in theater and have to be in theater and have to be an actor or have to be a dancer. That's true. Or, and if you don't have that muse chewing at your ear, I, you know, I That's don't true. think you should do it. And. For me, I was I was an archaeologist. I was teaching at Berkeley and UCLA, and an old friend of mine came to me and said, "Be on the board of art investment funds that our financial service company is forming." This was the mid '80s, and tell us what antiquities to buy. And at that time, it was not so much in the press this notion of cultural heritage and cultural the policy of protecting the patrimony of the country from which these antiquities are, are um, coming. And I said, absolutely not. You know, I'm finishing my PhD at Columbia and teaching there, and this is a, an ethical and a legal issue, and you really don't want to take money from people around the country for the, you know, for antiquities because they could get sued by the state of Turkey or whatever country this um, antiquity might come from if it's not illegally excavated because you've cut out its tongue. And she said, well, that's very interesting. Sit on the board and tell us what not to buy. Well, that hooked me, and therefore I sat on that board. And then they were doing theater investments. Oh, really? And they began to send me things to read because I was captive. By that time, I was teaching at Berkeley. And the one that hooked me, that they sent me, was the French version of Les Mis. Which is a great success. It, well, it, but, but, you know, to do the Royal Shakespeare, this is the Royal Shakespeare Company um, doing Victor Hugo's Les, Les Miserables, adapting it from, from the novel, this massive book being um, adapted from the French, sort of a, um, not a true musical, because the French really hate musicals, but more of a presentation of what the French already know about Victor Hugo mm -hmm. and all of the references to Voltaire mm -hmm. and so here I am trying to help translate in my schoolgirl French this this very complicated version of Les Mis but I, I loved Hugo I loved the book the notion of the Royal Shakespeare Company doing it totally hooked me I fly to London after we actually to make a long story very short we raise a third of the money for the Royal Shakespeare Company's version we fly over with all of the investors that came in through this big company. This was a big broker dealer that had thousands of agents around the country, none of whom, whom were very successful in selling this to their clients, as you can imagine. So I called my old school friends and my mother and father and my aunt and my uncle. And at any rate, that's another course on how to raise money. But um, so you, here we are, the Royal Shakespeare Company. I see a few previews. We go to the opening night. It's running four hours. Robert si Gloria's sister, Patty Lapone, is um, Fantine. Mm -hmm. And four hours fly by for every investor in the <coughs> audience. Everyone's weeping and cr crying. We get up the next morning. 22 newspapers in London. Um, that was part of the theory of this company that England is a place where everyone goes to the theater. The critics don't have the sway. It costs a half less than New York. We, I, I go get these newspapers, I look at them, they hate it. They absolutely kill it. They say, how dare they do this to, to Victor Hugo. I think your sister got some good nods. Yeah, yeah, she she did, got she some is, really yes. good nods. Yeah, She's she about got, the only thing right, that exactly. did. Right. And um, Cameron McIntosh called me in, he was the producer, and he had an office in the bowels of the Barbican Center, called me in the next morning, everybody bleary-eyed, and said, do you want your money back? Now, you have to understand, this never happens. You, you, as an investor, you give your money. So Daryl did it once, just recently with, my, with Mambo. Really? Uh, but it never happens. It's a loss. You, you, it's, a, it's a speculative investment that you make for the theater, and you don't expect to 
to get it back. And the fact that somebody would say that to you was unheard of. It was unheard of, but yeah. I didn't know it was unheard of. I, I, I had never done anything in theater before other than, you know, work for this company. I'd gone to the theater assiduously, and it, you know, in fact, the reason I loved um, Les Mis is, is Nicholas Nickleby, right. which flipped great. me out. Yeah, great. So, um, so did you get your money back? We said, I said, no. I said, no, we, everybody loved it. I said, everybody loved it. All of our, our, our investors loved it. The, the company is totally behind it. I, no, we don't want our money back. Andrew Lloyd Webber called him and said, I'm not going to give you the theater to transfer um, Les Mis from the Barbican. But the audience spoke. The audience loved that show, and the grosses kept going up and up and up. And it's still running in London um, and recouped 2,000% here in New York. Just goes to show you how nuts we are in the theater. I mean, you would, that's not a smart business incentive at no. all, and yet we're crazy that enough to stay with it. So it's interesting well, to we, me. So, but we know the audience. Well, know, you and I, I spoke about that. Yes, I know. The, you, thing, that's what's gonna, so the next question I was going to ask you is, so when you look at all these projects and when you think about what you're going to do and how you perceive it, do you become the audience member? Are you actually a member of the audience? Are you, is it it's your intellect that's judging based on theatrical expertise? How do you come to a decision about whether you want to do a play or this play or that musical, or this time for this play or this time for this musical? What are some of the processes that you go through? It has to be me as the audience member, and I would ask you the same thing. If you're going to spend as much time and effort and blood to produce something, don't you have to love that piece? Yeah, I. It's interesting because when my, in the nonprofit world, it's so interesting because you have such greater risk in a way than I do, um, because she'll spend upwards of let's say fifteen million dollars to put on the show, and I'll spend about five hundred. So there's a real difference. But it's but not my money. <laughs> no, I, well, exactly. But the thing that's the thing that I, I, I first, the first thing that gets me is the writing. Yes. The writing has to kind that, of resonate. The, that when right? I say the book, absolutely. The writing resonates in a way in which that is not. In my world, at least, I try to get something that's that's literate, something that's uh, there's a poetry to it or there's a language to it that I that is unique or wonderful. Like the pride. Like the pride, right? Or and at the same time, I actually want it to be about something. In my case, mm -hmm. I want the audience to feel something, and I want Act Three to be what they're talking about the play over dinner. Mm -hmm. For me, Act Three is going away from the theater because then that's the reason to have live theater mm -hmm. is that you're, it resonates mm -hmm. and it, you carry it with you and you go to dinner and you say, did you believe that character said that or and that dialogue is some, and that's what I do get in the song, by the way. But, uh, yes. You know, in a moment in a musical when the song hits. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, and I, I slave over trying to find that in, in every play that I've done because I, it's I, almost I impossible agree. to find. I completely agree. It's, it's all about something that has a cultural resonance for the audience today, for me. It, it's something that creates a continuity with all of our history as well as with the contemporary world. And if, if I feel that there's a resonance both historically and culturally today that can bring an audience together and bring a sense of community to that moment that we create in the theater, because it's we're, we're in the most ephemeral of, of industries. Oh, yeah. It's poof. So uh, this is interesting to me, because I, I describe you know, I have partners, and I describe with my partners that we have to find a play that's an issue that will resonate in today's world. Mm -hmm. So the next, one of the plays we're doing next year is about Alzheimer's, which is, again, you know, not a laugh riot. We did the Waverly Gallery. Well, Kenny Lonergan's, pr we produced that off Broadway. Exactly, Broadway. but I guess what I'm suggesting, or what I'm asking you is, when you talk about resonating in terms of the community and the culture that we live, is that, I say the word issue, is that what you mean? Or do you mean that you have an understanding of the, of the consciousness of where we are in society? Well, I try to think in those terms, but I can't always successfully do it because emotion intervenes. I mean, obviously, and that's the Greek term, catharsis, the whole notion of theater providing you and those with you a participatory moment that is either a moment of great sorrow that you experience because it's a, a commun something about your city, your people, your time. And certainly Alzheimer's is one of, one of our great tragic markers. Is that why we don't have in the theater such a young audience? Because people like us are picking plays, besides the pricing issue, which I understand is always a problem, even for our, people our age. But what's interesting to me is it, it, the theater's always dying, isn't it? And at the same time, they keep coming, right? And at the same time, there's an audience in New York, which is huge, as you well know, and yet we're always picking plays, somewhat of what we just described. Mm -hmm. 
And at the same time, whether I'm on stage or when producing, I often see an older audience. Um, and I've yet to crack the question as to how to get a younger audience to the theater. And there are theater companies in town that attract nothing but younger audiences. E education. I mean, I, I, I mean, obviously, you know, one of the things you see in, in, in England with the, the lower price tickets is you do see many more families, you know, even in the commercial um, area. But, um, it, it, I mean, clearly that is our great challenge to, to have families bring their children and to have it in, in, the, in the curriculum in our schools that, so that the, 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 that, that the arts and the performative arts are, are part of a program that, that is part of our, our living culture. But, but why? Culture. But why? I'm with you. I got the internet. I have hip hop. I have something that turns me on. I'm young and I'm vital. Why do I want to go? Why do I, I mean, I know why we do, but why do I want to sit in front of these people here and tell them they, they should make the theater part of their lives and part of the habit of going well, to the theater? I don't think we can tell them. I think we have to show them in a way. And how do we do that? By getting, getting them involved in theater in the, in the, you know, like you, in your programs, your educational programs, where you have, have the kids actually performing in productions or the 52nd Street Project. You know, th that transformative nature of actually working either on the stage or behind the stage, involved with that collaborative um, Did endeavor. you have an aha moment in, as a young person about the theater? Only from the viewpoint of the audience. Right, but did you have that moment? What was the show or what was the moment? And I have to admit, I was also, and in, in, in this is, this should, <laughs> this should be, this for me is almost a shaming moment, but I was also in, you know, like, uh, um, I was Miss Arkadelphia High School. You know, I performed the, a guitar solo on stage, <laughs> right? <And laughs> so, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I understand what it's like to be on stage, but that's not... But did you have that moment? Like, for me, it was Maria singing, you know, Tony's, but no, you know, something in West Side Story, I forget. I was a high school kid, and... Yes, yes. What was oh, the absolutely. Moment? What was there a moment for My you? parents brought me to New York and took me to My Fair Lady. Oh, that was it? Mm-hmm. And who did you identify with? Who did I identify with? Uh, of course, the um, the girl. Yes, terrific. <laughs> Eliza. Yeah, I, mean. I, I I saw that one. I think I think I saw that with Rex Harrison, and I mm -hmm. was just amazed at. Um, it was so English to me. You know, it was so I know. English. I know. I was so young. You know, I had no idea what it meant. I want to move on a little bit, if you don't mind. Um, what's it like being a woman in the theater? What's it like dealing with um, that sensibility? Um, we know that women buy tickets in the audience. Um, so how do you perceive a play or your audience in terms of women? And how do you overcome the glass ceiling, I guess you call it, in mm. the theater mm. as it exists today as a woman? Well, you're, I mean, you're, to start with the, your B question, yes, the, in the commercial world, the, the women, we know that the primary ticket buyers are 35 to 50 year old women. And they are the ones who drive the um, majority of the money. The, they are the economic engine, primarily, in, in our world. Are they in your world, in, in the not-for-profit world? I think that's true. Do they buy the subscriptions? Yeah, uh, yeah I think that's true. The, yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a, yes, the, the lawyers, the, husband, the, the lawyer husbands come with the wives who want to see the play. Mm -hmm. And the wa husbands don't really want to be there. Uh, and then they're, they're, they get intrigued and, and encouraged, then, and, and they, they're the ones who can't stop talking. Right. Well, that was interesting. Just, you know, but, mm -hmm. but it's definitely the women who, uh, who, who drive the, the sale. The women drive the sale. And it's interesting, and I, and I, don't, I don't know why, because I, it, what's it, what's it, what, men are what? Hunters and women are gatherers, right? So that sensibility. So this is a tribal experience coming we're, to the theater, We're the right? keepers of the cult. Well, exactly. There's and, a, the, and traditionally, we are the we are the repository from Chatal Huyuk, where's Johanna? Um, from Cha Chatal Huyuk all the way through um, the contemporary world, but especially in the ancient world, it's just absolutely clear that the 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 cultural keepers are the the um, the women. Well, it's remarkable because you know, like I I'm I pick Alzheimer's for example. It's told through a woman's eyes. But this story, um, or even Neil Labute, who's a guy I produce all the time, he's a misogynist, mm -hmm. and there's he a real it, there's a real clarity mm -hmm. about um, about an audience's intelligence mm -hmm. and response to the work on the stage, which is one tribal, mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And two, there's a femininity that's about it. I can't explain any better than that. that and what I mean by femininity is the sensitivity. Mm-hmm. There's a real sensitivity back and forth between the stage and the audience when it's alive, as you well know. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've often tried to get buddies of mine who are like, you know, macho dudes, really, macho, macho dudes, mm-hmm. like, and we drink beer and talk sports, and that's a cliche I realize, but that's what we do. <laughs> and they're not interested. They're not interested. In theater. No, they're not interested. As or they won't fact, admit they're interested. No, 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 this is the exact quote. The Pride I just did is a play I just did. It's about, uh, I thought, a beautiful play and a beautiful production. They of, went to the caveman thing about you know that remember when that was on on Broadway? Yeah, men men are yeah that one. Mm-hmm. Well, exactly. But but this is what I this was a beautiful play, a beautiful issue about about humanity despite gender preference. And the play starts in the fifties about a couple, a heterosexual couple, and compares itself with a homosexual couple in the eighties. And the whole point of doing the play was not to say oh this is great gay and that is straight, but rather to to discover the humanity in both couples. And this guy, who's a friend of mine, and I, tr- I try to get him involved, he said, that was good. It's all about gay vomit. <laughs> that was his response. Now, but that is a very real response mm-hmm. to the theater mm-hmm. as being extracurricular, shall I say, mm-hmm. and as an insensitive. And I, I don't know how to get, like, changing room. I don't know how to get the audience, male audience, into the theater. Well, you know, I have to say that Rocco Landisman is the head of the endowment right. now. Is you know the the whole notion that art works that in reality the factory worker that gets paid is no different than the artist who works for money for his painting or money for the play he writes that we put on or the woman that is creating um, pottery that we are buying. What whatever that art works and that this is a part of our culture that is equally valuable and. And Rocco even brought that up. He said that he thinks that some of his, some of the the Congress people in Washington think that art is a little too gay, and and the press kind of went after him about it. But what what is you know if, if we're talking about gender issues, if we question what's male and what's female, for God's sakes, then you know what you know why should we label an art form? Um, yeah, when, that's right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I mean, also, they're talking about that just for one second, that the idea that uh, the, 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 eco- the, eco- the economics of, of art in this city alone is nine to one. I mean, for every dollar spent in art, there's nine dollars returned, said that the other day, which is true in this, in this city. Uh, it's a billion dollar industry, mm-hmm. several billion dollars. And also that Broadway is only second to Wall Street yeah. in, the, in the dollars driven through the city, but from all the ancillary, from the, if Broadway is the, the center, um, then the hinterland is the hotels and the restaurants and all of the supportive um, um, economic engine that Broadway drives, and it's second only to Wall Street. I would say we're wizened professionals. That's about right. Uh, how, <laughs> how would you, just to share with a young audience here, how would you, um, how, I mean, risk and reward and failure and success is probably a lot of what they're going to be dealing with as they graduate. How do you, what advice would you give to yourself when you lose and to yourself when you win as a commercial producer or as a nonprofit producer? How, how, how have you toughened your skin and remained open at the same time? Mm. Mm. Am I open? <laughs> yes, I think so. <laughs> um, well, there's nothing worse than to have something that you believe has great currency, and I use that term on every level, um, that you've spent years and years working to bring to Broadway. My most recent um, really heartbreaking uh, non-success is what I prefer to call it was Bombay Dreams, which um, had been produced in, in London uh, to great success. And I have worked with Andrew Lloyd Webber and his company, really, the Really Useful Group, um, on, since Phantom of the Opera. So I approached them about bringing it to New York, and we produced it on Broadway. And it was $14 million. 14 In London, it cost, <coughs> I think it was 4 million pounds, 3.5 or 4 million pounds, which were these Seven? N- not even, but yeah, about. Mm. So it's you know it's much more expensive to do a show here, and um, it was a Bollywood musical, and uh, it, it, the audiences loved it, and it lasted about a year. But the critics savaged it, and I have to say that the way they savaged it was what I found the most difficult. There were personal attacks on. Weber, um, Terry T. It's terrible. Here, here, this shows you why actors don't read their reviews. 
I can remember what Terry Teach out of oh, the yeah. Wall Street Journal said oh. word for word. Yeah, he yeah. said that there, a backhoe should go and take every Andrew Lloyd Webber show out of every Broadway theater and that every investor that invested in his shows should lose every penny. And our, our investor group wrote a letter to the Wall Street Journal saying, you are the newspaper of financial record. How can you say this? How can you, your critic say this about whether he likes his work or not, say this about investors in these shows when Andrew Lloyd Webber has made more money for people work in the, working in the theater worldwide and for his investors than any single composer working today, whether you like his work or not. So that, you pick that, one, up? that one I wanted to keep my head <laughs> under the pillow for a while because I really I was so up? angry because I was angry because I, I was angry. How'd you pick yourself up? <sighs> How did I pick myself up? I kept it running. We kept it running a year and then decided that when we didn't get a star to come in because we would have needed a star, we didn't star cast, that we closed it and returned 20% of the money. And I also felt, you know, I want to do global theater. I want to do theater that's international in its intent. I like working um, to bring the myth and ritual and representative arts of other cultures to Broadway. And this was a South Asian musical, and it employed the mag most magnificently talented young actors, all of whom were thrilled to have their culture represented on stage, and for me, um, that was enough. So there, so so it's not just a capitalistic enterprise, it's no. not just an artistic enterprise <laughs> in you. It's also a kind of global's interesting. The urban, there's a kind of thing. Broadway being a mecca of some sort, London being a mecca of some sort, mm -hmm. and wanting to be a cultural landscape with the product that you that you deliver. Definitely. Tell me about that. What is that about? Well, I think that I think that comes from my background in archaeology, from my interest in the origins of culture and the origins of, especially of, of, writing. The my, my primary interest is the origins of the of the written word, of the pictograph, and of the beginning of writing of myth, and its representation in art, and all of my academic writings, my dissertation and my um, publications have been about myth and how we can study the re artistic representations of that society and study the texts. And if there's a lacuna or a break in one, that one will tell you about the other. And I believe that anybody who goes to the theater is seeing a living representation of what concerns our culture. And I love this. I mean, this is for a theater advocate. This is terrific. You know, I've never been. It's never been put to me this way. So, okay, now you're the president of the United States, and you have this. Uh, I'm just going to go through history. You know, you have the South in rebellion to the North. You have Watts in in in, in riots. You have uh, the Chicago crash, and you know, you have bootlegging. How would you use the theater? Culturally, how would you attack those questions in using the theater? Would you bring a certain kind of play? <laughs> you're making me feel like I'm the Delphic Oracle here. <laughs> no, I just think, well, it's fascinating because you're, you're, saying, no, you're, you're saying that. I like what you're saying. Uh -huh. I mean, I'm behind uh -huh. it. The idea that you can take culture mm -hmm. and have it meaningful to mm -hmm. an issue mm -hmm. or, and, 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 and meccas like London or New York and talk about the society we live in or the problems we face, mm -hmm. right? I mean, mm -hmm. that's what you're yeah, saying. I am, I am, I am. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting because one of the things that um, in my class, that my creative arts, cultural, and I have a terrific graduate students in this class, and one of the things um, we've been studying is Richard Florida's work on the creative class. And um, there's a premise that he has in there that I think would make an unbelievable um, core study for a play. Maybe we'll talk about this later. He, he, he talks about the change in class structure in America. He's an economist, basically. And he, he points out how we've gone from the industrial age to um, the working class, to the organizational class, to the service economy, and now to the creative class. And the creative class is a knowledge-based economy. It's not just those of us working in the arts, but it's the tech people and lawyers and knowledge-based. And this is now approaching almost 40% of our, of our culture. 
he points out that many of our cities are still in, the, they do not have this 40%. It's still an economy that's based more in the working class. Ooh. And therefore they have the older way of thinking as well. It's based on a more hierarchical society, it's based on a more traditional society, and that is where we have our... Political conservatism. <laughs> our regress regressive tendencies in terms of politics. Okay. And we don't have a vitality of the city. Right. We have vitalities in the cities where we have the knowledge-based economy. Which is what, of course, New York has, and which, of course, London has, which is why you have a vital theatrical community. So do you think this, this is that art and art and culture are so Now, wouldn't that be a fabulous dialogue for somebody like Yasmina Reza to get commissioned to do a, I mean, I, I just think of her because she does sort of Moliere kind of. Um, well, you're talking comedy there, though. I want to draw. It better be funny. Are you kidding? <laughs> we don't slit our wrists. <laughs> I want, I want the We live it every day. I want, I want, Phil, I, want Robert. Right, right, I want Pittsburgh to meet New York. You know what I mean? Let's see what happens. What do you say? Okay, well, that's a football game. <laughs> that's very good. That's very good. What about, um, I want to just change a little, I mean, how am I doing on time, you guys? Are we okay? Okay. How, how um, you know, again, we're theater pros and we also love the theater and we live and breathe and eat the theater as well and academia is kind of new, new for me certainly not new for you but you're revisiting it so how, gra how grateful that we're all that you've decided to revisit academia thanks to you sure <laughs> but what about what about um, the internet what about television what about film and particularly in light of these young people what about their perception of you know the the the, the antiquated form that we live in what how do we has it affected theater has it hurt theater? Has it helped theater? Do you aspire to mo do more films? Do you want to get into television as a producer? I've done, I've, I did a television show, um, a reality-based television show on getting into college. It was called The Scholar. And we had- Can you get to one getting a job in this economy for these kids? <laughs> I know, I know. That's, I mean, I mean obviously, uh, it, it, it's a hard thing to advise people to go into theater. There's no doubt about it. Well, it's a risky job, totally yeah. risky. Um, how, okay, how has, how has Movie, the, how, movies, TV, film influenced you and or do you want to do more of them? And Yeah, I would like to do more of them. And, and, I, and I do think that we need to, to think about doing things like, I don't know, maybe streaming our plays on, 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 online or, or putting them into movie theaters or, you know, doing this thing that, that Peter Gelb has done at the Met with uh -huh. the opera. There's no reason we shouldn't have our, because remember when our unions wouldn't let us oh, yeah. make a film of our of our shows right. while they were running on Broadway, they were convinced it would close them. Right. And now, obviously, we know it's just the opposite, that if something is in one me form of media, it can only cross-fertilize the... If they're good. If, yeah, that's <laughs> true. That, 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 that little getting, matter. Exactly. <laughs> so, so you don't see a threat in yourself up to the theater with regard to film or TV? Or the internet, because I mean, in terms of my world, I use the internet more than anything else right now in terms of how I sell a show. Um, we, absolutely, we're selling what on Broadway. We're selling, I think, already something like fifty something percent of our tickets online. Which, on, online, mm -hmm. yeah, but also marketing. How do you? Oh, marketing is it's huge. Absolutely, we don't spend money on the on the newspapers any longer, where we used to allocate almost. I all think of that's our money. why the Times as critics aren't as powerful because their their advertising income is being waylaid by the internet in terms of what we as producers are doing because I get a tremendous bang for my buck in, on the internet that I didn't get and don't get from the from the uh, print media. With, without a doubt. Viral marketing, viral marketing, guerrilla marketing are, have totally replaced what we used to do in the And do you, I actually like it better. Do you find it? I do. You do, I do too. I find it more mm -hmm. effective. Well, it's, it's so frustrating to spend, what were we, uh, the New York Times, I don't know what they're charging 50? right now. Full page is 50, isn't it? It was it was a hundred. Oh, so I'm, that's how old I am. Yeah, it was a hundred. A hundred. One full page is a hundred thousand. <laughs> and now Jerry used to say when he was alive, the one of the, uh, one of the Sherwoods who I knew very well used to say, "Well, advertising doesn't do anything. It just sort of reinforces." And maybe he turned out to be right. <laughs> exactly. This reinforces. This is the, the head show. of the Schubert organization yeah. who recently passed away. Yeah. But anyway, he just reinforces the show. It doesn't really bring a sell a ticket. So I mean. I'm curious for us to share with them, you know, like, 
What are you guys, are you guys, what are your career paths? Just to let me know. I mean, you're going to be interviewers like this. What, what are your <laughs> career paths? Just give me some idea. Anybody? Fundraiser. Fundraiser? Uh, designer, artist, and writer. Okay. Anybody else? Artistic director. Okay. So I can talk about artistic director, but I guess what I'm, I'm, I'm curious about is, like, you know, Every just wouldn't you agree? Every generation has its problem getting into the industry. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. And in our world, it was whatever it was, and in this world, it's a recession. So I mean, that's nothing new, right? Talent or money. In our, you know. Exactly. So, but what would you advise young people today, or how would you advise young people today in getting involved either in the cultural pursuit of either film, TV, or theater, or for that matter, artistic director? What would you advise? Uh, a young person. Education, a degree, you know, I, I, I truly think that where you choose to go to school and this magnificent campus with, with your division, Lang, Milano, Parsons, you know, to take full advantage of, of, of that in your degree program, you know, don't, don't be narrow, really interdisciplinary to me is the, the word if you want to be in the arts. And the notion that you're building a community of friends with, with whom you'll be working probably for the rest of your life or networking with them. And keep that, you know, keep your contact list updated and, you know, stay in. T of course, you all have all this social networking, so you do that anyway. I, I think you have to remember, but <laughs> you do it every day. We don't. I, I'm not, I don't. I, I don't know. No, but no. I, but you're saying, you're, saying, you're, saying well, you're taking something for, you're, I think you're saying something very important that, that you're taking for granted. It seems to me that you're responsible to your career or to yourself and you're willing to work at that mm -hmm. when you say social networking mm -hmm. and, and building a community mm -hmm. and that you're that's part of your job is that what you're saying it is without a doubt without a, that's how you that for me the way I, every step of my life's journey has been due to connections that I've made who have either come back to me or I've gone to them and I think I I think that that's absolutely critical for everyone to be. I mean, I wish no one sat me on their knee and said that to me. Right. I I did it because you know it's probably hard for you all to to imagine a time when you weren't online. But I like to be on the telephone. Um, it drove my husband crazy, but I like to be on the telephone. I stayed in touch with people. I wrote letters and. That's, that's how I ended up moving into theater. That's how I ended up going to Columbia for my graduate work. You know, it was all through. Um, now, are you seeking something? And you say, oh, that's how, what were you seeking? Well, occasionally I would know what I was thinking, but a lot of times I was clueless. I mean, I, I had an idea, but, uh, maybe, but I certainly didn't know I was seeking to become involved with this big corporation. So you, so, because this is about being an artistic director and choosing a season, you sort of found your own way. Mm -hmm. Which mm -hmm. is what it's all really all about, don't you think? But it's about, you know, that, I think finding your own way, I think that our right brain and our left brain, you know, <laughs> communicate. Um, you know, there, are mar there are markers along the way that we only recognize after we've chosen that way. So there's a little bit of intuition that you're saying? Mm -hmm. um, because, I, I, you know, I didn't ever intend to be an artistic director. It's a complete surprise to me that I, that I am an artistic director. And one of the reasons I started my theater company was out of pure anger at being an actor and the way the actors were treating treated in this city so I decided to you know give it the old one too and I was going to challenge the system at large and create my own theater and, and in doing that now all the people that I 26 years later that I was so angry at now come to now me and they right. all want me to do blah 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 exactly but but and you can help them. <laughs> exactly but I but I was initially very angry and that impelled me it forced me it made me my passion red hot um not necessarily my wisdom, but certainly my passion, red hot, to, to bang down doors and fight the fight to be able to fill us, and step by step, learning by your mistakes. And for me, being very clear about that that was a mistake, not beating yourself up, but that was a bad choice. What's next? Okay, I'm, I learned from that, now make put that together and try make that choice. And I mean from the ground up is where I started. I, I hung my own lights. But with whom did you work when you, did, when you made your theater? Me and Bernie, you mean? Mm -hmm. Bernie. A, a friend. A friend, yes, a friend, right. A friend, my student, actually. 
Oh, really? He was my student. How then. interesting. Yeah, a student. And he was he wanted to have the theater. I didn't. Hmm. Uh, but he was also able to organize. Like, I'm not a good... Math still confuses me. But he was able to do that. So mm -hmm. he had the right brain. I had the left brain. And together, mm -hmm. we were better as one person than separate. And now, of course, you learn... Now I'm a math person. And he's more an, art, an artist because you learn over time. Um, you know, you learn your strengths become weaknesses and your weaknesses become strength, I guess, over time. But, but I guess my point is that the passion and the energy to create that company or create that future moment to moment, being honest about your mistakes and realizing your mistakes and taking them on the chin and moving on. That's just part of living. And uh, I'm going to make more mistakes before I go, you know. So, like, and overcoming the failures. I mean, I, you know. Wooden Breaks for me as a play, I loved. I loved it. And 15 it people too. showed up. You know, it was what just terrible. Very bad. I have not, I also as an actor, I spent six months trying to you get know, an elephant. I tried to produce Great Men of Science. I love his work. Yeah. Out. Yeah. He's a fantastic Spider Man's coming back. He, he's writing Spider Man. That's just wild. I know, but they actually, put, they a, actually got this, the theater. This is a playwright who wrote the most fabulously kind of historical and somewhat esoteric plays. And The Wooden Breeks is about people that would get trapped in their caskets and they would have a little bell on top. So people would be buried frequently, apparently, and then they would discover they were trying to get out. So in England, they put a little bell on top so that if they got stuck, they could ring that little bell. And great men, of, at any rate, this is a wonderful playwright. And he was chosen by Julie Taymor to do Spider-Man. Which is, a, I don't know, you don't know Spider-Man, right? 40 million, okay. <laughs> well, it's actually happening, so uh, they've got dates. Uh, I don't know if they have the money. Have you heard they got the money? It, they've got, what's his name? That it was my partner on Bombay Dreams, who is the producer, promoter of the Rolling Stones. Well, they've got the money, then. They've got the money. Okay, so that they actually, I know they picked dates. This is $40 million. This has to play to 100% over 10 years. Wow. This is the worst deal possible. Would you agree? It is. Okay, so, but they're doing it, right? Yeah. Okay. And this playwright who... It has to last forever. It does. It essentially. Has to, it's got to be Lion King, yeah. right? Doesn't yeah. it be Lion Nothing short of Lion King. I mean, this will King. be a living, you know, cultural artifact in the 25th century. I don't know. I don't know how they think. It's they remarkable. It. Somebody, you know, it's a, and it, it's probably going to get $40 million because they have Cirque du Soleil's doing the flying. So Spider-Man's going to... I mean, you got to see it just it for that, right? It will be amazing. Yeah, yeah, it'll be just that. And it's... Oh, it's you too. <coughs> Bono is doing the music. Um, talking back, going back, uh, how are we doing on time, by the way? Okay? It's around getting towards seven, so maybe you want to start taking questions. I have it here next week. Okay. Well, do you want to take questions now? Because I don't sure. have to ask a question. Now, I am not going to let you be quiet, okay? <laughs> I, I, came with, I came to you the first time, and I got one answer, two answers. So, any questions you'd like to ask? Artistic director, go ahead. Yeah. So we've involved them in the arts. They all grew up doing the arts, and their interest in the arts is to pursue it themselves. Right. So there's sort of this dilemma that's taking place where we all go to the, we all go to the people shows to support each other, but the foundation of an audience that can fund the next generation of theater, there's still a big question about mark about where that's going to come from. So how do you? What are your thoughts on how we do that, knowing that even if the audiences are showing up, their reason for showing up may not be a match for their capacity to fund? I can tell you what I did. May I take the lead on this? Please, I, I can tell you what I did. I, I can tell you this is a heartache in front of you. That there's a the, an initial nonprofit. You got a solid ten years of friends, family, and girlfriends and boyfriends, right? And then at the ten year mark, all of a sudden, what happens is you can't carry on anymore. Exactly what you just described. You can't hang another light. You can't do another play for no money, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then you have to make a decision. And the decision, in my case, was a complete break. I had a company of 50 actors, 20 playwrights, 10 directors. We did every weekend, blah, blah, blah. We all put up each other's show. At 10 years, I had to fire a friend because we weren't going forward. And I had to let go of the entire company and decide to professionalize the staff. And what I mean by that is you actually have to pay yourself. The board will cut your budget. It's the first line that gets cut. But the budget has to be 
uh, professionalized. And you got to say, I'm a theater with this mission, and I can't pay for any of it. But if I had my druthers, it would be a $2 million operation with three shows every year. And okay. Then you have to start going after people who can fund that, both, both from the bottom up and from the board up. That may mean you only do one show a year, but you're totally change, making a paradigm shift and you're professionalizing the theater as opposed to the camp and the fun and the family that it's been. That is a terrible time to go through. It's the only way you survive. There's a lot of 10-year-old theaters that all of a sudden, or two-year-old, three, they don't, it's a lot of work that you have that's in front of you. Also, don't you have to exist for th two or three years before you can actually apply for the grant for funding? No, no, no. Three I months, you... you can get the grants. Three months, you got your 501c3, you can or get a lawyer, that's easy. Getting, but and then and then the next so the first salary you have to pay is yourself as the artistic director, which of course you're not going to do because as I did for 16 years, any money that I made I gave it back to the theater to put the show up, or I'd pay the actors. So that's the com completely wrong choice. And professionalizing your position is the first thing, and then getting a development director, which is the second thing, which is somebody who knows how to fundraise, not the actor next to you who's not working, but I can write the grants. I mean, and they're coming out of this school. They're coming out of this school, right? You're sitting next to one of them. <laughs> they're being treated now, and I would recommend what you start. What Elizabeth said. Right, whatever, and you start out with each other on that level. Now, 10 years, 15 years, you may not work together anymore, but you start out together working on that level to develop. And your budget may only be under $100,000 for the first five years. That's okay. But you're setting yourself up professionally as opposed to what's so much easier, everybody does a job to, to bring their own career to the fore. I wrote the play, I acted the part, I la la To my credit, I never acted in my own theater. I was going to ask that question. Yeah, and I've never acted in my own theater. I acted everywhere else, but not in my own theater, so that I could be that artistic director, the number one guy, the professional, blah, 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 and make the hard decisions. You're gonna to have to fire your friends and make, make the decision over her as a fundraiser versus her as a fundraiser. I mean, that's part of the job. Um, but that's the only that that would save you. It took me six. It took me ten years to get to that slot, and sixteen years to pay myself. I think if you could, within the first five years, really had an office, even if it's even if it's a post office box, had a telephone other than your cell, had a letterhead other than your home address, mm -hmm. had a show up that you rented the theater and you sh you know hung your shingle on, and in fact had a staff which may be you and a uh, development director. And uh, maybe an office manager, whatever. And that's how you start. And then the development director, right from the get-go, is building an audience. Everybody that comes to that theater has to know that you're supporting the art in some way, shape, or form. It's not a free-for-all for your friends to put on a show. It is an institution-building enterprise. That's very hard when you're a young person to accept as a reality. And then you think of, now you don't know these guys, but like Joe Pat, that's what he did. He was public theater maven, and he created out of, out of Cafe Chino, was it? Jo the public theater. And you have to be not afraid to ask and to be passionate about your belief in the art. That's the antidote to the no. The antidote to the no, unless you know, you're, you know, you're independently wealthy, is how important this is, which is what interests me about Liz in terms of the idea of culture and cities and how important it is as opposed to a particular play. Mm -hmm. You know, like you go to your investors about a particular project, but beneath that or underneath that is the myth, the ancient culture, what you were talking about, and the passion of what you believe the theater can be and do for our culture and our country. Correct? Correct. And I also raise money frequently in pools rather than individual shows. What's that mean? That means, I mean, one thing that really frustrates me is that so much money is funneled into the film industry from places like Wall Street and not into theater. And there's absolutely no reason because there you can make money. You can make a tremendous amount of money in theater. And you can lose a tremendous amount, but they do the same thing in Hollywood. <coughs> right, of course. The hedge, the hedge funds put in billions of dollars um, every year and, and for the studios, you know, underwrite their bottom line. And the pool was um, also used in the film industry through the 80s and it was forbidden for theater. Why? Um, AG? Right. The Attorney General. We had a ver Elizabeth Block, a very, very stringent Attorney General who, go who governed theater in the state of New York. 
and she did not um, allow it was a it was just not allowed in the state of New York and the company that brought me into the theater mutual benefit um, ins insurance company and financial service company began lobbying along with um, Prubation and some of the other big broker dealers for um, actually they went to the um, to the Congress and and a law was passed that said that theater could use it in 1991 and the first um, pool was done by mutual benefit and Prubation around aspects of love and Phantom of the Opera and a few other projects and then I did, I've done several pools, one with Margot Lyon and Hal Luftig and, and another one on my own and I'm doing another one now and it allows you to raise money across a, a broad platform and to say what the, your broader goals are and, and perhaps, well the fir my, first, my first pool I had a, a large piece of rent and that was my keystone. Um, Wait, hold on, you're talking, you're good, it's Swiss turn. One second. Okay. So you're, you're not, there, you've got a project like Rent mm -hmm. that you want to do. Mm -hmm. Now, instead of going to me, an investor, and I say, was on the board of the New York Theater Workshop at the time, so I couldn't b become involved in it a a as a producer with Kevin and Jeffrey, but they gave me a piece to give to my investors. I gotcha. So, but, but you're, instead of going to an individual like myself mm -hmm. and asking for a unit, which yes. could be 5,000 or 200,000, yes. whatever that is, to get to your 1 million or 14 mm -hmm. million, mm -hmm. instead of doing that, you mm -hmm. go to a pool. I go to you and I say, give me a dollar and I'll put that in five to ten different productions like a mutual fund and spread your risk. Oh, I see what you're saying. That's what you mean by yeah. pool. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. within the so you're putting a group together to buy it to four or five shows to, to spread the risk. Right. And it, and for for young people, I think for those people who were at all interested in this kind of a, a venture, um, if, if and you could do this in film, you could do this in documentaries, you could do this to buy art. It's it's a financial instrument that allows you to raise money from individuals, and they don't have to be um, uh, qualified investors, which is a, is a term that means that you you make either two hundred thousand a year in the last three years, or excluding your house, you are your net worth is a million dollars. Now that's what you. In the old days, they, they were very stringent about it. But you know, these days, I, I, I hesitate to even mention the Securities and Exchange Commission. Yeah, right, right, right. Uh, you right. know, I mean, we were always worried they were going to come go through our files. I mean, you know, it's such a it's well. There's so some justification to that, not to you personally, but there were some producers out there that were shamming. Apparently the there were. Apparently yeah. there were. <laughs> but but uh, compared to what goes on in Hollywood. Well, fair enough. That's I mean, true. please. Fair enough. <laughs> Well, let's not show our jewelry laundry. Let's ask these kids what else they'd like to know about us. So at any rate, the notion of using different financial instruments to bring capital to the performing arts is something that that I'm I'm quite passionate about. And I think that that the, that if we could more clearly monetize, um, you, know, you know how we so closely hold our numbers. Right. Right. If we if we could more more openly monetize our industry, that we would have clearly um, access to, to more capital, which would help um, young, young people who want to have jobs in this industry as well. Hmm, that's interesting. And, and obviously, yes. and, and, and then, you know, in your arena, the public-private partnerships that, you know, Rocco's talking about. And well, um, I, Rock, obviously, Rocco Landisman is the new NEA chief, and, and uh, Liz is a friend of his. What, what would be your, give us a flash of what you think the headline for Rocco will be. What he's going to be able to do? Yeah. You know, we, our country has so many problems at the moment. Going back to Richard Florida, <laughs> but I, th I do think that he will make a difference in Washington. Um, he he is a passionate advocate for the arts and for their role and the vitality of our not only our cities but our culture. And he is one straight shooter, fearless, absolutely fearless. And he, he is talking to those individuals in Congress who are the least likely to agree with him because he is fearless. And he is um, able to, you know Rocco, you yeah. know how he can communicate with just about anybody. Right. Um, he, 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 he believes that we can have a more active funding of of the of the arts and the vitality of the arts through these public private partnerships which could mean bringing in money from you know that front page of the the hedge fund managers that all of whom were, received 4 billion 3 billion Lilies was 999 million i mean if you put together a 
if you are able to put together funding that would bridge that gap, that could go to individual grants for artists, that could go for support nonprofits, nonprofits. symphonies, ballets. What would you tell? What would you tell young people about pooling and and that idea? I mean, how would now I'm twenty something. I've just graduated college, and somebody's talking about a pool. What do I do about that? How do I do that? How do you do that? You yeah. go you go to your lawyer and you say you want to put together a pool. And in, in fact, your lawyer probably I I the first pool I put together, I think I paid my lawyer a thousand bucks. Which, you know, I, I eventually got out of the pool the pool to, to pay them. Yeah, I, I structured it into the pool. And it allowed me to do um, a few plays. Really? Mm hmm It's just so it, uh, now from the I like just to show you the difference, let's do a board member works for Sony. At the end of the year, he has boxes and boxes of classical CDs that he could give us for free. And we'd stand at the 9th, Street, 9th Avenue Street Fair for a weekend and make $10,000 selling CDs. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> that you do what you, you know. But I came in through this. I, I was not a financial person. I think you this know, is I the was, smartest thing I've ever heard. But I was an archaeologist, and I, you know, I had no idea about these kinds of things. But I catapulted into this arena through a financial service company and a huge, one of the 10 largest insurance companies. So... I came in on a very elevated level, plus I had investors. I had investors who were making money in Les Mis and Phantom of the Opera. So I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm so privileged in that way that, you know, it's sort of off Do you the need chart. money to create art? No, you need inspiration. Do you need money to find an audience? Street theater. So. Public art. Public art, but I'm with you. I'm so with you, because um, I'm on their side. You know, let's face it. They're 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 the gen they're they're the legacy, if you will, right? So, what's interesting about their questions is I've forgotten. I have a different set of questions, and like you do as well. You know. Um, yeah. At least they can stay on their parents' health care. That's true. <laughs> Our students um, are oriented to be change agents. Whether it's through community development, whether it's the nonprofit, whether it's the organizational change. So I'm wondering if we could talk a little bit about how theater can be an instrument for that. How would students who are interested in developing their community use theater as a way to do that? So this now the same now we just did this thing with pride. Mm -hmm. Well, this pride the show just been the idea of getting heterosexuals and homosexuals mm -hmm. together, and the idea of gender preference being not an issue but rather love being an issue. Those are big themes that in turn this play brought out. Um, uh, um, I mean, I, have, I do this all the time. The Alzheimer's awesome. is play I'm doing next year uh, to bring in to the adult community that or my audience rather. People that all of us in my age are concerned about what we're facing is obviously a Alzheimer's in our future or that idea, whether it be senior dementia or Alzheimer's. Again, having the conversation. And we bring in as part of the play every Tuesday a talk back with the audience, with the expert of the subject of that play. So that's one thing we do. Um, the other thing we do is um, in the public school system, uh, I, I don't know about you, but I think, I don't know where this idea came from, it's 26 years later, but somehow the cultural aspects of the you know, education was being cut so we felt yeah. that, right so we felt we wanted to do something about that so we went into not the Daltons but the public high schools where there is no cultural whatsoever as a matter of fact we don't even know if they speak English but we went into those schools and using theater techniques and having them write their own plays make them discover their own voice make them discover themselves as an independent community divorced from their immigrant status or from their lack of education or lack of opportunity and create uh, a youth theater company which now has 50 people into it there's a show going up this weekend that they're putting on themselves and so those are some of the things that theater itself as an agent of change is without a doubt uh, unparalleled uh, that's terrific and particularly when you talk about the education um, we have so many students in here who are interested in making a difference in education so what a fantastic chance to take away well I, first of all there's 485 nonprofits in this city 
any one of them would, would partner with us with a group or a school or something to be able to facilitate one helping getting a younger audience in spreading the word and at the same time facilitating their mission into the school and vice versa and these not-for-profits they your the the theaters that you're about to have a home and do your big capital raise but the, the areas in which these theaters have been founded the theaters themselves are an agent of change and are a increasingly vital hub within those communities so it's it goes both ways you are both reaching out to right. the, the neighborhoods right. and as well the neighborhood is then coming to you and restaurants and foot traffic That's and right. it, it's 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 that vital well, BAM thing. Well, is the most perfect example. BAM is, right? and the public. And the public, exactly. And the public, and you know, you, you can, and, 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 and. Well, I was thinking, that's a big scale. There's a little less, I can't pronounce it, forgive me, Les Pagonas, I think is the name of the theater in the Bronx. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. it's a little theater, it's Hispanic, mm -hmm. and at the same time, they have created a neighborhood around it. And in Harlem. And in Harlem, same Absolutely. thing. It's quite remarkable. So, mm -hmm. that is, that the, is what the- The Apollo. The, yep. You know, what is it, what's the, what's the timing of the show? We are band of players, are we? Or something, you yes, know. Yes, That's what we do. We go on our covered wagon from town to town. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? That's who the theater people Shakespeare are. Shakespeare Walla, that wonderful <laughs> exactly. film about Shakespeare in India. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you talk about uh, encouraging and looking for, well, investors and donors. So maybe you can talk to us a bit about some of the skills that you've developed having been an archaeologist to find investors or to find donors and to communicate with them, to keep them involved, and do you get younger either donors or investors involved, and, and how do you do that? When you say having been an archaeologist, do you mean I go excavate? Do <laughs> you mean uh, raising you, money for my excavations? No, no. I mean, uh, how did you transfer the skills that you had as an academic and archaeologist into raising money from the for-profit? Mm -hmm. For investors, and Bob, maybe you could speak to any of the skills that you've developed from your background as an actor to you know, pr help persuade people, or you know, mm -hmm. talking about investors and donors, mm -hmm. and some of the skills that mm -hmm. you've used. You want to go first? Shall I go first? Go ahead, ladies first. Oh. Um, I never talked about being a woman, but we'll, we'll maybe circle back to that. Um, <laughs> the uh, <laughs> the <coughs> fundraising for me has never been about the ask. It's about, been about my talking about my enthusiasm for a project and someone saying, have you raised all the money? I don't think I've ever directly asked anyone. I talk about the project, I talk about my passion for the project, I talk about what this project means, and that's how But I you come money. in as a high flyer. In other words, but even in the beginning. Yeah, but Bob, even the, but in the beginning, like you're talking to people who now have I resources. Now I do. Now I do. Now I do. Absolutely. Right. I mean, you're talking to somebody, let's say an investor or stockbroker, who's got he's got ten thousand, twenty thousand to throw away, and so you're having a conversation. That's a whole different scenario than what I'm talking to, which is also I started when it was little little money. I mean, yeah. Les Mis, the units were ten thousand dollars, and you could take quarters and halves. See, can't do that anymore. Can't right? do that anymore. Right. Well, you can, but... All right, so let's, for $2,500, you can give it to a musical. And that's just fun. Let's spend $2,500 and go to opening night, and that's what that's pretty much what it was. Mm -hmm. No, my, my... I mean, she's... A, the, the key phrase is that there's a passion behind what she's talking mm -hmm. about. She's not really asking for money. From the standpoint of nonprofit, you've got to develop a strategy about how you're going to raise money. That's what I mean by the budget. How are you going to put together that budget? They're giving to the institution. Pardon me? They're giving to the institution. They're giving to the institution. But, but, but they don't give to the institution. They only give to people. You only give money people to people. You don't give money people to the institution. That's, yes. Right? So you've got to be, you can't, you can't let, you, you, listen, everybody's smart outside there. You know, so they know why you want to have lunch with them or they know why you want to talk to them. <laughs> they're not silly, you know. The fact that they agree to the lunch means that they're interested in something about you that they would like to talk about. So Is that why you took me to dinner? No. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been asked for anything. <laughs> I haven't asked for anything, but I do have a capital <laughs> campaign coming. <up. laughs> but anyway, the point is that you, you it's how accessible, what's the strategy you're accessible? To, like, when I hang out with Bob Carey here, that board is multi, multi, multi millionaires. His ask is way up there because he's got an audience of that ask. 
my ask at donor level is like, you know, I'm lucky if I get $5,000. So it's a much different strata. So who you're playing to is really important, number one. Number two, you're going to get a no. That's a given. There's a no in the, right in front of you. So how do you, I used to say, get the shekels shaken from the tree. How do you, <laughs> how do you get the sh shekels shaken from the tree? That's the task. And you either do it by cajoling, by laughing, by charm, by anger, by pointing at However you do it is how you do it. Guilt. Guilt's a great one. Do you know what I mean? But the point is you got to know where you are in the strata. If you've got a big donor, everybody goes, oh, oh. Maybe I'll get ten thousand, fifty thousand, a hundred thousand dollars, and that's totally putting it out of perspective. The reason to ask for money is the passion you have in the mission of the institution or the play that you're producing. Period. Nobody else has to like it. You have that passion. If you don't raise the money, in my world, you're not going to put it on. I think the same world for you, right? Right. Same money. So you, you've got to be able to to facilitate the ask because you're impassioned about what it is that you're selling, if mm -hmm. you will. Um, you have to strategize. I mean, yes. I, I, you know, I'm being a little disingenuous because you do strategize. Absolutely. And you know, having been on the board of of not nonprofits, some a couple of premier nonprofits, uh, you know, I've been trained um, in how to go to individuals, and you can't insult them by asking for too little. You can't overwhelm them for ask by asking too much. You have to have the right people at the table with you when you make that ask. And all of that kind of strategy is very, very real, and you have to do your, just as all my investors were people that I knew, and I know what rings their bells, and I, of course I rang them. <laughs> With the Royal Shakespeare Company, I rang it like nuts. Right, you know, you're, you're, it, you even, even if you lose everything, right. you know, you're supporting the Royal Shakespeare Company, and many of these people were great lovers of, of that organization. Right. Oftentimes, you have to talk to people who care about the theater. I mean, you know, like my guy, you know, gay is got whatever that that's quote about pride. He's not going to invest in the theater. Do you know? He just doesn't get it. Not interested. Really, he's not. Now I can. I can guilt him into some money, but he'll it's going to be small. He'll bet on a football game with you. Yeah, he'll bet on a football game with him, right. But it's going to be small money. I mean, you got to, and that's one of, the, one of the things about this town, Chicago, I mm -hmm. think, not L.A., maybe San Francisco. These Boston, are, maybe Boston. Boston, yeah, to a certain degree, mm -hmm. and I think Texas, of all places. Mm -hmm. You have theater lovers there. People who love the theater. That's where a lot of my investors are. Pardon me? A lot of my investors. Yeah, they love the theater. So that's a market. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? I would not suggest that you go to Los Angeles to put up a theater company. Anybody's working in the theater is only to get a film job. And any money that's there is going to be, at best, come with such strings, forget about it. It's just not interesting. That They're not interested in the theater, really. San Francisco, yes. Chicago, absolutely. Mm -hmm. As young people, if I were you... If, if nothing clicks for you in New York, I think Chicago's a great place to go for theater, for young people in particular. Mm -hmm. There's a great marketplace, a great youthful um, scene in which people are hungry for the theater. The ass would be falling off your lips. It would not be a, a difficult thing like in New York where there's, you gotta compete with me, or you gotta compete with 100 theaters your size. Do you know what I mean? Um, it's, it's, it's always difficult. And it's fun. You, you know, it's fun. You gotta, you gotta fun? see it. Well, you gotta see it as fun. Wait, you, you mean raising money? Yeah. Oh my, I'm gonna call you. Well, no, you gotta. Well, it's you, you, yeah, you got yeah because well, listen, you can't. What be do you mean? A, we'd be a great duo. Wait, wait. Yeah. You can't. You can't. You, the no does not. It, the, the no does not stop you. I, I could find somebody else. Okay. Yeah. The no does not stop you. For some reason, there's a commitment. I, I can't do that. I can't do the guilt thing, though. Well, I'm, yeah, Bertie's better at it than I am. But I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm. Yes, you can. You'd be surprised. <laughs> yes, you can. You know, I believe in the theater. I believe, like, I My want you all. In, I want you all to be in the theater, not in the theater. I want you to be in the audience to look at a show and have the feelings that I have. There's no better way to live. Yeah, there really it's is. A, it's a mistress that'll hurt you beyond. It'll <laughs> beat you up and tear you apart and spit you out. There's no question about it. But there's no better way to live, to have that joy and that expectation and being dashed or being you know, surprised. What about the surprises in your life in the theater? Oh, extraordinary. Absolutely. Did you ever think that well, would it's, happen? It's such a, it's such a, for me, the, the addiction is the <laughs> collaborative nature of it and oh. getting to work with the artists. And then seeing this uh, amazing thing happen on stage and then go away. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, I'm curious because you bring up this whole idea about like how do we connect to our generation or how do we get theater to like to 
continue. Um, and I, I wonder if it's possibly like things that are kind of like almost alternative plays in the sense like Avenue Q or like when they did Evil Dead the musical or like these kind of like adaptations like Romeo and Juliet in 1986 or you know um, La Boheme turning into Moulin Rouge. Like do you think it's like they're trying to push the envelope in a way or? I think that's, I think that's trying to, that's under the guise of um, trying to find a younger audience. I don't know how organic that really is, because I think our younger audience is found today in like the streaming video. I think the younger audience today is found in social networking, and how does theater, how will theater answer those calls? Like I can say as a producer, target marketing, target marketing through the internet is my assessment of trying to find an audience in a different way, not necessarily younger generation. How to find you is not to take uh, you know uh, what a Coraline and turn it into a musical, which is what I did. Trying to find, I got the music people who liked Coraline's composer. I didn't get a younger generation. So it's really where do you, where is your cultural soul live? That's what I'm trying to tap into as a producer. What is it that you can't walk away from because you're compelled to go to it because it is the it is the moment it is the time of your life at this moment like you know in my day for example what concerts would come up i don't know i forgot <laughs> but let's say let's say I, I <laughs> yes exactly but you know i can't think about it now because i can't remember but let's say chicago just for uh, that's not the group but let's say chicago comes into town it's something about that group it's something that they're saying that i have the Beatles, the beginning the Beatles, Beatles yeah. for me. The beginning, you know, yesterday, the beginning Beatles before, just, just before the White Album. That for me was a time that spoke to me. So that was a time that spoke to me and that was a cultural response to what was going on inside. It was as if it were expressing something about our generation. Exactly. And you all have that and you, you should work together to figure out what that is. I mean, Green Day probably feels old to you by now, I would assume. So, you, you know, I don't know. <laughs> who, what would you say? Who is it? I want to know because I want to tap into it. What? Green Day right now, like they have a musical adaptation, and like I think that you can go to plays like or musicals like Fela or Back by Will and Jada Pinkett Smith and Jay Z. And I went to it, and everybody it was a young urban audience, so everybody there was my age, and you know tickets were relatively inexpensive to get right front. Like I only paid like seventy five dollars per seat to be right in the front. So I think that that's a good way. To and did, did, you, the play, did you relate to it? Right. Did the play get to you? Um, I enjoy, it wasn't what I expected, honestly, but it, I did enjoy it and I enjoyed the music. But you know, there are there are methods that like I, I don't think have been addressed up until this point until you know you get people like Jay Z back in musicals. So yeah, that, well, that was that's that's great. I mean, obviously that that raises the profile, which is you know obviously good for us because we don't the music of our our Broadway shows doesn't usually end up on. Um, on online for you all, you right? Know, right. Know, yeah. No, see, I think like you know, think about the guys who did Google. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't now. I'm off my. I don't know what I'm talking about. Sergey okay? Brin. Right. I don't know what I'm talking about. But there's a guy who's sitting in a room by himself, maybe at your age at one time, right? And he says, "Let's try this." And out of that came Google. Now, I'm not suggesting that if you go into the theater, you're going to become Universal Studios. That's not my point. My point is that that original thinking will tap into something if you understand yourselves or however he did it wherever that lives that will create what I'm saying is the legacy of theater I really don't want you and I don't think Liz does want you to do what we did that's what we did do you and know you wouldn't want to do it <laughs> right but the idea of taking the theater further mm -hmm. if the, evolving further if there's such a thing mm -hmm. uh, and I think evolving further involves things like media and the net and the computer and what is the storytelling in, in lights of that? Not just that there's a stage and here's the media. That's obvious. That's boring. It's what does the media do to the story to tell a story? How is storytelling affected and changed by the net? Do we not do, look at what's happening to TV. We don't need to have an hour show. We can stream whatever we want, whenever we want on the net. There's something about how we're delivering storytelling in your generation different than our generation. And, and, and what is the next level of that with regard to 
and Steve Jobs with iTunes. Hello, the whole music industry is gone. And now everybody goes, so where is that? Not that you have to be the originators of a brand new movement. That's not what I'm suggesting. That's too much of a responsibility. I'm suggesting what is the little kernel in your heart, in your life, in your soul that says, I want to put on this particular play, you know, but, this particular But show. you want to tell your stories. I mean, you, you know, you're, right. you're, you have your own stories and those, those are what you want, we want to hear too. I mean, um, I keep saying to my son, what is she? No, know, I don't want to hear him. That means I'm old. <laughs> I'm only kidding. <laughs> you want to hear your son's story. I do, I do. I do, I do already. We have about five minutes left. So, questions? So, I need to know a little bit about you. I know that you're an art, artist, writer. And Svana. A fashion Svana. And a writer? Yes. And an artist? Yes. So, explain that to me. Um, That's kind of curious. Yeah. Combination. Uh -huh. That's a lot, okay, of, a lot of talent. Of, um, I have a degree in fashion design. And uh, I started writing as a hobby because I was like, it, it was something that was just really distressed and I enjoyed doing it. Um, so I started out a blog and then people just started pouring into it and like, um, I got a lot of really good reviews and I adapted and evolved the style over time. So then I got my first writing gig out of that. So I started writing <laughs> professionally because of that. Um, so I write for exhibitions and galleries and things like that. Um, and as, and I also started working on my fashion line on the side. Um, which has a different whole different story to it. Um, my father's company, I had to step in and take over it, so I have textile background from that, as well as my fashion design degree, so I combined all <coughs> of it and started developing textiles, started making my clothing. Um, so now I'm doing art installations with that as well, so it's like a whole, it's just like, I didn't even expect it or, to But it's very organic, the way you yeah, describe it. Yeah, yeah. it's just mm -hmm. kind, of, kind of kept pace. And I'm so where do you want to be five years from now? I don't know, I don't even know what I'm going to be tomorrow, because you know, <laughs> like they wake me up and they're like, you have to do this, so I'm like, I just, Kind of adapt and go along with the flow. So. Okay, I want to challenge you because okay. that's creativity, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. There's an aesthetic and an art artistry working there that's creativity. Mm -hmm. Now, where's the professionalization of it in terms of what we're talking about? Because right now, at your age, you can afford rolling with the punches, right? Right. And so I end up here. I don't know how I got it. I don't know how I became an artistic director. I'm exactly the same head as you. But but you could be smarter than me. Right. Five years from now, you can say, I want my own theater, my own company, whatever that is. That is also a, a an educational aspect to it. With my, I'm making this up, but my own company with regard to design and also the educational input of that design with regard to how it's in academia, and at the same time you're doing art installations around the world. You're that what's the woman the, who, who just died who did the things in Central Park, the orange things. Do you know what I'm saying? Okay, but I'm saying there's a vision. What I'm saying is there's a vision. And I'm did, saying did to she you, die? Did, did, did the Christo, wife die? Yes. Christo's wife died? Yeah. I think There's a vision died. there. Claude, in her, Claude, right? Claude. So what Claude. is your vision, even though you don't know it? Right. That you start to discipline the creativity. Because you're youthful, so it's all, you're immortal, you're in Machiavelli, all that stuff happens, right? right? But what's the vision for yourself in terms of, I want to try this. Nope, that didn't work. I want, so sculpting out of that stone, if you will, a concept which in turn you're testing through all of your techniques, as opposed to just living out of your techniques. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. It's like, I am an actor, I need a script to act. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, I really want to say something as an actor. So I'm in a terrible position because I'm always waiting for the script, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Write your script. Make sense? Yeah, makes sense. Great. What do you want to do? Me? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I have a totally different background. So uh, I'm, I'm coming from development corporations. Uh, and that's what I, what I want to work in in the long term. Which is interesting because I, I exactly in terms of um, post-conflict reconstruction, theater also plays a role, bringing people together. Um, conflict resolution. Conflict resolution, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. also educational theater, actually, mm -hmm. in very rural areas. Mm -hmm. So you say people So is it rural development you're interested in? or in that's, what, that's what I've been working in for a couple of years. Mm. You know, so now there's a two theater companies in this country that actually go into rural communities mm -hmm. and create plays with the rural community mm -hmm. to foster better relationships, foster understanding, and foster economic that Shakespeare, growth. That, that Shakespeare group that, um, that comes to New York and then raises money and goes back out and works in the... But not only Shakespeare, they actually, there's a group that actually, mm -hmm. a bunch of artists get in there and they go into a town and they start doing community theater with the town mm -hmm. and create the town's play. It's a fascinating, yeah, fascinating. Uh, exercise. Do you know the name of the 
I can find that. Yeah, I'm trying to remember where Dynamite is. I can find it. They do it actually in the South. <laughs> Not that I want to go there, but they do, <laughs> they do it in the South. What about you? Me? Yeah. Oh, um, like city development. Who? Ultimately, I want to go back to my hometown and make it a better place. And I have a note here about Richard, Florida, because it's like that name just keeps coming to me. So I just think it's wonderful, the idea of incorporating art into a city to help it grow and these creative minds and cultivating. And how are you going to overcome the politics of no when it comes to downtown development? I don't know. And that's why I'm trying to focus on like the financials and the more nitty gritty politics side of things. Because I'm very good with the ideas, but I don't have the quantitative background. So I'm well, you can find you can find that. Get, get your Florida books and, you know, and Shoshana. <laughs> <laughs> what, what is your city? Florida. And what, how, how large a city is it? We have about 50,000 people. I'm sorry, Warner Brothers that? Was that Warner Brothers? Was that Warner Brothers? Like that? No. <laughs> no, I don't believe so. Perhaps, maybe? It came from Ohio. We were near, we were near, near with Warner. Oh, okay. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, <clears throat> it's crazy. I did my undergrad in screenwriting and how I kind of integrate that with urban policy. Um, it's crazy, I don't, I'm not sure. Um, I think maybe working with the school system, you know, like you said, to incorporate the arts back into the school system, you know, um, giving young children a chance to develop that creativity so that they can, you know, be more open and more inspired growing up. Um, I was a parent teacher, I mean a parents, a president of the Parents Teachers Association um, for about five years. And it's just in Harlem. And it's just amazing how kids are just lost to the world of the streets. You know, even with parents who are trying very hard to you know, work with their children. The larger world says, mommy's wrong. You know, um, I had a young, a young man, we were teaching him alternatives to violence. He was eight years old. And he thought it was the greatest thing to become a drug dealer. And if he died, he knew he'd have a mural about his life on the wall. And he thought that was a great thing, eight years old. You know, and um, you know, I said to him, you know, drug dealers either die, you know, or go to jail. But he tells me that, um, you know, most black men are in jail anyway. So by the time I'm 21, I'm either gonna be in jail. I mean, he had accepted the fact that he would either be in jail or be dead. And that since they teach so much about drug use, if you still want to use it, why would, why shouldn't I be the one to sell it and make the money? You know, so kids have no like vision anymore. You know, they just see this small world that they are locked into. The school systems don't. Um, see, this do is what I. This is exactly why I said to you because it's that's exactly you know. Say you're interested in the arts, for example. You just can't say I want to be in the arts anymore because there's forces, there are countermanding forces in the world which say I need the money for Iraq or I need the money for whatever, do you know what I mean? So how do you facilitate an argument that there's value here? Well, one is you have to have the vision and two, you can't just be an artist anymore. That's what's different about this generation than my generation. My art generation, we could just say, oh, I'm gonna be an actor, do you know what I mean? Because the, the world wasn't as complex or as dangerous as much, I don't think, 35, 40 years ago as it is now. Or at least we didn't know about it. Because there, was, there wasn't as much television. There wasn't as exactly. much. There was no internet. There was. So it's, 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 all of us have, in the theater, we have these high moral principles, even though we're a little wacko. We have these high moral things about why we do what we do. But that is not enough anymore. You have to have the quantitative, quantitative evidence that proves it's a value and a yeah, greater exactly. value than the other argument. You're absolutely right. You don't have to convince me that an eight-year-old doing drugs or doing being a drug dealer or dying or whatever is is worse than you know. I agree with you, but it's not enough to say to me 
being a being a politico with X amount of dollars not available for, therefore I can't. But she's a storyteller. Too. No, no, I understand. But I'm <laughs> saying, I'm saying, I'm saying you have to have a vision that says that goes beyond, mm -hmm. goes beyond just the issue. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's what the school's teaching you how to put that together. But I agree with Elizabeth with screenplay and then this moral conscience that you have clearly. Mm -hmm. That's your art. Mm -hmm. How do you put on the play that in turn gives you an audience, which is the problem we all share. But if you if you're turning that talent to working with children, which is a you know obviously a, a profound choice, then there are um, you know I mean we your your paradigm of what you've done in with your your collective group and the Fifty Second Street Project. I don't know if you know that group that's transformed. The neighborhood of Hell's Kitchen, um, through working with the kids in that area, they it was founded in the early '80s when Hell's Kitchen was a really, really, you know, pretty. It, it, there was a lot, a lot of trouble in that neighborhood at that time, and and a lot of children without, you know, parents helping them in in any way because they were struggling to to survive. And this organization began to reach out to the schools in the Hell's Kitchen area to work with them, with theater professionals to express themselves through, through, the, through the performing arts. And they gradually built such a large group of children with whom they were working that they began to put in place after school programs and many of these, it's, you know, it's, been, it's been transformative for, for kids in this area. And they have, they have a, um, you know, they, you can get the literature from, from them about how to put in place this kind of a, a program. You know, I, I don't know if that would be at all helpful to you, but there are, there are paradigms of at least using theater with no cost, just volunteer labor, because um, it was totally volunteer labor. No, no one was, I, I, don't, I don't think they asked themselves the professional question. No, they didn't. They, they never didn't. did. No, they didn't. They never did. Uh-uh. It wasn't um, important. But no. listen, my youth, kid, my youth theater company kids are not going to be professionals either. Basically, it's a socialization exercise to have them discover their own voice. And really say what they mean, and, and learn how to relate to each other in a way in which that does not lead towards that. And what's well, happened. that boy's story. If he could, if he could say, if if you, if you know, if you, you're with your passion for making him understand the choice he was making. If he could tell that story, I mean, that story, and have done. other kids act it out. I'm here with the host. Okay. Tonight. Okay. <laughs> I want to take this opportunity to thank you, Robin. Sure. Are you going to stick around here and talk about us? <laughs> For those of you who are interested in learning more about um, either of them, I'm sure they're willing to stay for a few minutes. Oh, sure, I'm going to stay. Conversation yeah. and, um, and to explore more uh, fully courses that we're offering in the arts and culture area uh, and also courses that we're conceiving of and hoping to work, uh, work through in the future in collaboration with the drama school. So thank you both so much. Sure, sure. Well, can I, one last, one parting comment I've got to tell you. Be careful of cynicism. Mm -hmm. It's rampant. Mm -hmm. Cynicism will kill any dream. Mm -hmm. And you gotta, you, this is an industry of dreams. Mm -hmm. And Liz and I can testify that you cannot let cynicism, even if it's your wife in front of you, <laughs> impact you in a way in which you can't move forward. No matter what the skill set you're going after, cynicism is a death knell. So be careful of that. <laughs>